All right, so then, what we then are trying to do society uh, in society is take people right, who are born with uh, three different uh, assortments of these psychological capacities here, put them through the educational process, and what we need is people come out who are able to perform what turns out to be three different kinds of, uh, of social functions here. So Plato then goes on to, uh, to conclude, it makes sense that we would have one kind of education that is appropriate for the physical are the people who are going to end up doing more physical work, another kind of education that's more appropriate for people who are going to end up uh, in this line of work, and another kind of education that's appropriate for people who are in this kind of work. Now chances are very good at the start of the beginning process, we're not going to know which students are going to fall into which category, so we might take them all in as a group, and everybody has pretty much the same curriculum. But what we're looking for is signs very early on that this student really is going to go off on, in this direction. The student really is this kind of a kid, and so he's more likely to go off in that direction. And so as soon as, uh, as the teachers are in a position to make a good judgment, judgment rather, we start, start sorting the students out into those different categories, and we start then customizing the, uh, the educational process in those different categories. Until chances are very good by the time we get to high school, uh, it may very well be the case that these students don't have high school. They have been put into apprenticeship programs after they've learned their letters, after they've, after they've learned basic numeracy and so forth. These students would be off to police academy or off into military training, and these guys would be the ones who would go on into uh, higher education and study diplomacy, politics, philosophy, higher order mathematics, and all of the more abstracted subjects as well. All right, now that's a, a, a quick and dirty version of Plato's account, but the point here is that we're connecting a view of human nature philosophically with a certain political philosophy and again, the philosophy positions that we take have huge implications for educational practice. In this case, the educational practice that we're concerned with is tracking. Uh, and tracking is one of those perennial issues in the education world. So understanding the, uh, the, the importance of the philosophical arguments that lead people to take this position on tracking as opposed to that position is, uh, is absolutely important uh, as well. We might make a mention uh, quickly uh, historically in historical context too if if we think about the medieval world, the dominant structure of the medieval world also fell into a, a threefold category. We had three groups of people. We had uh, the, 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 the aristocrats, uh, we had the clergy, and we had the peasantry. Uh, in the purest form of, of feudal society. And if you think about the aristocrats, the official job description of the aristocrats is to protect the realm. And so the aristocrats are the ones who started off as soldiers and a big part of uh, their training was uh, initially in martial training. Uh, and so they were uh, 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 trained to do those kinds of functions. The, uh, uh, the leadership uh, in, uh, in, a, in many feudal societies, particularly Western feudal societies before the days of church and state separation, the theory and principle was that the church has supremacy uh, over the secular order, and so the highest leaders, including the Pope especially, uh, need to have a certain sort of uh, educational process to, to, to be at the, at the top of the, the social order, right, so to speak. Of course, there was in uh, much of medieval times an ongoing tension between the aristocracy, right, and the clergy over which one had uh, supremacy. But at least in theory, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the clergy was supposed to be supreme. If we think of the, uh, the standard ceremony when a king becomes king, uh, the king kneels down before, say, the pope, and it is the pope who places the crown on the king's head. That's symbolic of the transfer, transfer of power, that it's the pope who, uh, as God's representative uh, on earth, is the one who authorizes, sanctions, and legitimates the, the uh, secular political power that the king is, uh, is supposed to be, uh, to be, to be uh, exercising. And then finally, we have the broad mass of society, the, uh, the peasantry, and we might here just throw in the, the guilds and the craftsmen and a few uh, freeholder yeomen, uh, but for the most part, their education is fairly simplistic and it's, uh, and it's fo focused on uh, the, uh, the physically oriented types of uh, projects there. So again, in classical medieval society, classical feudal society, we again have a tripartite division. 
uh, 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 that parallels uh, Plato's uh, almost perfectly. And uh, we do also know that in feudal society, the education of the peasantry, the education of the aristocrats, and the education of the clergy was very different. Uh, uh, and so uh, in religious form, it ends up being the same thing as Plato's more secular form. What they have, though, in common is that they are both idealists uh, uh, philosophically. All right, we'll stop there.